Hey guys, so you know what an argument is, and you know that there are two different types of arguments. But how do you know what an argument is good or bad? In other words, how do you go about evaluating arguments? That's the thing we're going to talk about today. So luckily, there is a kind of general form you can follow when evaluating arguments, no matter whether they're deductive or inductive. Ultimately, there are differences in how you go about doing that. Uh, there's different terminology and the meaning is slightly different, you know, to the extent that the argument types are different. But there's some general questions we ask. So we're going to go over those general questions first before we get into the specifics of evaluating deductive arguments and then evaluating inductive arguments. So no matter the kind of argument we are evaluating, we ask two questions. The first question Would the premises support the conclusion if they were true? And that's the key there, is the if. Right, so you first look at the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. You don't look at any specific premise and think about whether it's true or not. That's not what you do, at least when you're talking about this quality. There is a second thing that we're going to get into in a second. But one of the things you do is, okay, there's your premises, let's say, and there's your conclusion. When you're talking about this thing, what you do is, you look about the relationship between these two groups, right? And you determine whether that relationship is adequate. Um, now, what exactly we mean by adequate differs if, if it's a deductive argument or an inductive argument, but the general principle is still the same. And you look at the relationship between the premises and the conclusions when you consider the premises being true, right? Like hypothetically, if the premises were true, would they support the conclusion? That's the one thing you could look for when evaluating arguments. Um, but of course, that's not the only thing. The second thing you look for is, are the premises actually true? So, after you figure out the relationship between the premises and the conclusion, regardless of their truth, or regardless of their actual truth, let's say, then you look at whether or not the premises are actually true. And there are different properties that are associated with these questions. So let's look at some examples. And let's start with a deductive argument, just because I think that's easiest and it maybe should be fresh in your mind. So take, for example, the basic one that we always do, that you're always going to look at in any of your philosophy classes, right? You say premise one, all humans are mortal. Premise two, you say me or Socrates or any person you can think of, but let's just use me. You say Professor Seeley is human. And you conclude that therefore I am mortal, all right? So let's look at this together. The first thing is, well, check out this group and figure out the relationship that this group has to this, right? So what's going on here? That first question is, do the premises support the conclusion? Yes, right? And we, we talked about this inadvertently in, in the last lesson. It's like, if these premises were true, regardless of whether they are, 
if they were true, they would necessarily entail the conclusion because the conclusion was already contained within it, right? So that's the one quality we look for. But it's not the only quality we look for, and I'll explain why. Let's look at another example. But in that respect, the argument's good, right? Because the premises support the conclusion. Let's look at another one. I gave you a wacky example in the lesson involving a toaster. I'm gonna to slightly modify it a little bit. Let's say you say premise one, all women have eight arms. Then you say premise two, all eight-legged things I'm sorry, all eight-armed things can fly. So all women have eight arms, and all eight-armed things can fly. If these premises were true, what conclusion would necessarily follow? And, of course, what you would do is connect this term to that term, so you would say, oh, so therefore, all women can fly. And so you look at this and you're like, that's weird sounding, right? Well, there's a reason why you're saying it's weird sounding, but it's separate from the last question we asked. So if you look at this objectively, you would have to say, yes, uh, the premises support the conclusion, right? So it has that property. But the reason you're still having an issue with this argument is because you're wondering like, oh, are the premises actually true? Which is the second quality. Now, when we're evaluating deductive arguments, we have names for these things. When determining uh, the goodness, let's say, uh, of a deductive argument, we look for something called validity. And we look for something called soundness. Now what's the difference between those things? The exact difference between those two properties we just talked about. So an argument is valid, uh, specifically a deductive argument, and that's key here because with induction we use different terms. All right, so when you're looking at a deduction you say a deductive argument is valid if and only if uh, the premises necessarily entail the conclusion. That's what makes a deductive argument valid, right? And if you're thinking like, oh, isn't that just the definition of deduction that we talked about? Yes, because you define a deduction in terms of a valid deduction rather than an invalid one. If you're wondering what does an invalid deduction look like, I mean, think of something wacky that kind of sounds like it's going to be a deduction, but doesn't actually work. For example, um, you know, all, like if we were in class, I usually put some crazy ones. Uh, all frogs are dead. Um, all dead things are, or let's even do something weirder. Say you say all frogs are green. Um, all roaches are birds, therefore all frogs are birds. Like, it, you see how it tries to be a deduct, deduction because it has that all language, right? You get the impression that there's supposed to be this necessary relation uh, set up, but it doesn't actually work. So, you won't really see those. Like, we're not going to be dealing with invalid deductions, I would, I would say, in class, probably. But you just want to know that a deduction is valid if and only if it meets that definition, right? If the conclusion necessarily follows. So it's either valid or invalid, right? Those are the two options. But what about soundness? Well, we say that a deductive argument is sound if and only if two criteria are met. And you need both of these criteria, right? They're both necessary, but they're also only jointly sufficient. So you can't just have one. You need both of the things. So uh, a deduction is sound if and only if one, the argument is valid. Uh, 
right, which automatically tells you there's no such thing as a deductive argument that's invalid but sound. That's just not an option. If it's sound, or yeah, if you know an argument is sound, you know it automatically has to be valid. And if you're looking at an argument and it's valid, it may be sound, but if you know that it's invalid, it's automatically unsound. But that's not the only thing we look for, because clearly there's other stuff we're concerned with. Um, and again, think back to the example about the toaster in the lesson, or the women with, with eight arms or whatever, right? So in order to be sound, it needs to be valid, but also all of the premises must be true. And again, we're giving you words literally here. All of the premises must be true. So if there's one premise, it has to be true. If there's two, both have to be true. If there's eight, all eight has to be true. Right? It doesn't matter if seven are true and one is not. If what, even one of the premises is false, automatically unsound. So if you set this up like, like a Punnett square, right? to think back to elementary school science, you kind of have three options, the, and the fourth one being blank. So you could say, and a deductive argument could be valid and sound, valid and unsound, or invalid and unsound. That fourth option doesn't exist. There's nothing that's invalid but sound. So think about how this relates to the examples we looked at. So the classic, all humans are mortal, that one, valid, and also sound. Because it is true that all humans are mortal, and it is true that I am a human, right? No curveballs there. So that one's valid and sound. But then if you look at the one, like, you know, all toasters are made of leather, all leather things could time travel, therefore all toasters could time travel. That's a valid argument, right? Because mathematically it works, in a matter of speaking. Um, the conclusion necessarily follows, but the premises aren't true. So that would be an example of an argument that's valid, but unsound. Or the one with all women have eight arms, all eight-armed things could fly, therefore all women can fly. Valid, but unsound. And you want to look at the and, and when you're talking about soundness, you have two options. Sound, unsound. Uh, right? It's not, it, it's sometimes we get linguistically weird, like we say, has validity, does not have validity, has soundness, is soundness. Um, to make it simple, it's just valid, invalid, sound, unsound. Those are the different values you look for. And that's it for deductive arguments. But as we know, there are other kinds of arguments. So what do we look for in inductive arguments? Well, we kind of look for the same thing, um, although we use different words and there's a slight variation down here. So when you're talking about uh, inductive arguments, you don't look for validity and soundness, rather you look for strength and cogency. Strength and cogency. And one of the things you kind of have to do when evaluating arguments in a logic class and even when working in philosophy in general is you want to kind of get rid of any, how do we say, like preconceived notions about words. Because ordinarily you might say, oh, why can't any argument be called strong or weak? Why can't any good argument be called cogent? Well, it's because they mean specific things in logic. So an inductive argument is strong uh, if and only if the premises, let's say, adequately support the conclusion. And this already makes things interesting because validity was binary, right? It was like valid, invalid, nothing in between, no third option, right? But now it's a little different because we know that inductions don't work in terms of 
necessi uh, necessity, possibility, impossibility. It's more based on like probability. And when we're considering probability, strength, unlike validity, seems more like a scale. It doesn't seem as binary. So it's, it's kind of like it could be more or less strong, which can get confusing because you're like, well, that one can work, but it's not the strongest, so what do I call it? In this class, I'm going to keep it simple. If the premises seem to adequately support the conclusion, then we're going to call it strong. If they're outlandish enough to where it doesn't adequately support the conclusion, I'll always try and make it fairly obvious at this stage in the game, then it's weak. Right? I'm not going to throw any curveballs. So it's strong if the premises, you know, reasonably support the conclusion, and weak if it doesn't. And we'll look at some examples in a second. Now, cogency follows suit. We say um, an inductive argument is cogent if and only if the argument is strong. And all the premises are true. Right, so it's, it kind of mirrors validity and soundness, it's just that you have to change it up a little bit. But it's basically the same thing. You're looking at, on the one hand, the relationship between the premises and the conclusion, and on the other hand, whether or not the premises are actually true. So, same thing. Um, all the premises have to be true, not most, not just some. And the Punnett square rule would apply here. I don't know why I keep saying Punnett square. I just, I just always think of it. So you would say you can have an argument that's strong and cogent. We, uh, sorry, strong and cogent. Strong, uncogent. Weak, uncogent. There's no such thing as weak, cogent. For the same reason, there's no such thing as invalid but uh, sound, right? So what would examples of these be? Because we looked at the deductive ones and not the inductive ones yet. Here's another basic uh, argument you'll encounter in logic or in metaphysics or epistemology, whatever philosophy class you're in. You say premise one, the sun has risen every day for the past 2,000 years, let's say. And so you conclude from that, oh, therefore, the sun will rise tomorrow. So, because the sun has risen every day in the past 2,000 years, you say, therefore, the sun will rise tomorrow. Seems like a pretty good argument. Like, it'd be weird if the sun didn't rise tomorrow. Um, so first and foremost, though, we have to recognize that this is an inductive argument, not a deductive one. A lot of the times, people mistake strong inductive arguments for deductive ones. And the way you avoid doing that is to remember that we're using words literally here. So it's only deductive if that conclusion necessarily follows, which means there's literally no way it can be imagined for the conclusion not to follow. And if you look at this, you say, well, yeah, the sun's got to rise tomorrow. It has to. But I'm going to say to you, okay, imagine a world where the sun rose every day for 2,000 years. You say, uh-huh. And I say, but then it doesn't rise the other day. And you're going to be like, okay, I can imagine that. And I say, exactly. That's why it's inductive. Or like, if I drop this marker, you know, a bunch of times, it's going to fall every time. So I say, oh, every time I drop the marker, it's going to fall. But I say, all right, imagine one time I let go of the marker and it floats up. You're going to be like, that's weird, but I can imagine that. So it's inductive, right? It's a, it doesn't matter about likelihood or weirdness. If you can imagine anything at all that's distinct, then it makes it inductive. So this is inductive, and it happens to be a strong argument, right? If, if something's happening every day for 2,000 years, something's probably happening in the background or at least you know between the uh, interaction between your perception and the background that's making it happen and so you can 
reasonably infer that the same thing is going to happen the next day, right? Um, and this is also true premise, right? We don't look at the true conclusion, we look at the true premise. So not only is it strong, but it is cogent. Now what would an example of an argument that's strong but uncogent look like? Let's see. Let's change things up a bit. So premise one, I always think of this one. I say premise one, 98% um, of Americans are vegans. Okay. And already you're like, mm, this sounds weird, but just bear with me. Premise two, you say, I don't know, Bob is an American. You look at this, what would you conclude? And what you would conclude is, okay, so Bob is probably a vegetarian, right? Or, or a vegan, rather. Seems pretty reasonable. So this is an inductive argument, right? Because there's a 2% chance that he's not a vegan. Uh, so you can imagine him not being vegan, even if it was true that 98% of Americans were vegan, right? And you know it's a strong induction because, hey, if, you're, if the odds are in your favor at 98%, you should bet on that. That's like very strong. But is it a cogent argument? No. Right? Because forget about Bob, we don't even know who that is. Um, you just look at the first premise and you're like, it's not true that 98% of Americans are vegan. Like, that is obviously a false premise. And I'm always going to give you ones that I think you should be able to obviously spot as false. So because this is false, even though it's a strong argument, it's an uncogent argument. And if you're wondering, like, what would a weak inductive argument look like? Let's say you say, you know, 1% of Americans are vegan. Bob is an American. Oh, so Bob is vegan. That's a weak argument. Like, there's a 1% chance that he is the thing. You don't seem to have adequate support, right? And that's, that's basically it. So you, you know, you have all the building blocks here. Um, and you're going to need all this stuff because from this point onward, things are going to get a little different because we're going to be looking at more formal, like symbolic stuff. And you need to have this in your pocket in order for that to make sense. And then we'll also look at some informal stuff in the future. But by now, you know, you know what claims are, the different types of claims. You know what truth is, you know what knowledge is, what the different types of knowledge are, you know what an argument is, the different types of arguments, and then now you know what you look for when you're evaluating arguments, and you know how evaluating a deductive argument is distinct from evaluating an inductive argument. And these tools are going to allow you to not only succeed in class, but engage, let's say, more effectively with arguments you hear in the world and enhance your own argument skills, I would say. If you're able to use all the stuff we do in class, those things should be there, right? Which is precisely why um, I'll ask you for to come up with your own examples of stuff and then also at some point we're going to be evaluating media uh, and the arguments within different forms of media using all this stuff. So but that is it for today. As always, if you guys have any questions, send an email or come to office hours. See you around.